Welcome to News Nation's Back Scroll, where we look back at our major news coverage on the most important topics and personalities of our time. Modern day space race, countries around the globe pushing to be the first to prove life beyond Earth. China, now the latest country, saying it's investigating the possibility of aliens. In a report published today, China says it has picked up on, quote, suspicious signals they believe could be from an extraterrestrial civilization. Now, scientists there are utilizing their China Sky Eye. It's the world's largest and most sensitive radio telescope. They say the technology holds a major advantage in searching for extraterrestrial civilizations, a larger observation area, twice as high sensitivity, and 19 beams that receive signals from different sky areas. Now, one of our favorites, certainly one of my favorites, space journalist Leonard David is joining us now. All right, Leonard, what do you think about China's report? Okay, you hit the word, suspicious and could be. Uh, that story has been pulled off the uh, Chinese uh, media site that uh, put it out to begin with. And I think there's some embarrassment in there, maybe. Uh, but I checked with uh, UC Berkeley uh, one of my favorite SETI uh, radio astronomers who works with those folks. And he said to me that it's radio frequency interference. That's, uh, you know, some spurious signals are still getting into the uh, uh, giant uh, radio telescope that China's built. However, uh, the point is at one point in our coming up history, this story is going to be real and we're going to have to figure out how we handle it and you know journalists like me we love to jump on these stories so you know that we're all going to be all, all over this because you like you said in the premise this is a bit of a race to find a new civilization or a civilization out there beyond earth and it's a it's a space race in its own right. All right, so you know, let's go back to the, to the technology that that China has. You know, it, it's using this radio telescope. It is the largest in the world. It, Leonard, is that technology better suited potentially to finding alien life? They are purposefully uh, putting on new equipment on this uh, facility to search for extraterrestrial, what they call techno signatures or some kind of signals coming from other intelligent life out there. So. Yeah, yeah, this is a very capable telescope. And I think your viewers got to remember, we just lost a few years ago, Arecibo in Puerto Rico that collapsed. Right. So, so this is a major instrument now in the world. And uh, China, to their credit, has in, uh, is inviting uh, the international community to be involved and use this facility. So it's a very encouraging sign, however, I think this story is a little bit uh, on the suspicious side, mm -hmm. and like you said, it uh, it has tendencies to be a little bit uh, uh, off track. So we'll see. But I do think we're on the edge of something significant. And when you add up the James Webb Space Telescope, it's up there. It's about ready to take its first images. Right. Uh, and we've got incredible new capability on the ground now, not only with China but other new instruments coming on online. I think we're in a time frame where, you know, this question of are we alone, it's not that question. It's how crowded is it? That's the question. That is a question. Okay, Leonard, we only have about 10 seconds. How soon do you think we will actually know without a doubt? I'm putting you on the spot. Keep, keep phoning me back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it's imminent. I All think right. it, whatever, what, how you want to uh, look in the dictionary for eminent. <laughs> it is eminent. All right. You heard it here first, everyone. Space journalist, one of my absolute favorite people to talk to, Leonard David. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Right. Oh, thanks. Maybe closer to knowing the truth, scientists embarked on a two-week deep sea dive into the Pacific Ocean near Papua New Guinea, retrieving possible UFO material from a meteor on the ocean's floor.
pretty cool. Scientists were able to bring back 50 of these tiny droplets that contain material that does not exist in our solar system. One of the scientists who went on the excursion is joining us now. It's Harvard University astrophysicist uh, Avi Loeb. Uh, Dr. Loeb, so good to have you. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. So it's my understanding that you have these uh, what you call metallic marbles with you right now. Can you give us a little show and tell and, and why yeah. you believe it's from another place? <laughs> well, I actually got the delivery from FedEx of the materials. And here is one of the vials that contains uh, some of these uh, spherules that we call them. Can you take it uh, out? These... Are you allowed to touch them? Yeah, actually, we picked them up with tweezers. They were embedded in uh, black powder, which is volcanic ash that was attracted to the magnets on a sled that we dragged over the ocean floor at a depth of two kilometers. It was almost an impossible mission, uh, but we were able to find the uh, 50 of those, and there are many more in the materials that uh, we collected, and uh, they appear as millimeter size, milligram in mass, oh, wow. uh, marbles, metallic marbles. My daughter asked if she can put one on a necklace, and I said, uh, <laughs> they're so small you can't thread them. Yeah, but, um, what, and, but what are they, doctor? Yeah, so they are the molten droplets from the surface of an object. The first one that humans ever identified as coming from outside the solar system, bigger than a half a, milli half a meter in size, about 500 kilograms that exploded over the Pacific Ocean in 2014 as it collided with Earth. Uh, and it was moving faster than 95% of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun, and moreover, was tougher in material strength than even iron meteorites, than all 272 space rocks wow. cataloged by and, NASA. And doctor, if this happened you know, 10 years ago, why now? And why did you suspect that this meteor in particular at the bottom of the ocean would have signs of alien life? What tipped you off? Well, um, it took us five years to actually recognize that it's not bound to the sun. And the U.S. government confirmed it at the 99.999% confidence. And then we realized that it must be tougher than all space rocks that NASA cataloged. And it moved faster than 95% of the stars. So that raised the possibility that it may be artificial in origin, just like Voyager that we launched to interstellar space. Uh, imagine it in a billion years colliding with a planet. It would appear as a meteor. So we went there and we found the materials from that uh, meteor. And now we are analyzing them in the laboratories at Harvard University, UC Berkeley, and the Brooker Corporation in Germany. Wow. Well, I can hear your enthusiasm. Um, to have been a fly on the wall with y'all or, or in the ocean when y'all were doing this would have been something. I also wanted your take on this, Doctor. How is the government reacting to all the recent public reports of alien sightings? Is it softening its stance on the non existence of alien life, or what say you? Oh. I think the government is agnostic. I actually asked uh, at the Washington National Cathedral, I attended an event with Avril Haines, the director of national intelligence, and I asked her, what do you make of those anomalous phenomena? And she said, I don't know. And so my understanding is the government is puzzled. Uh, I'm not sure they know what they have at hand. It's a matter of science. Anything to do with interstellar space has nothing to do with national security. Yeah. One last question for you, doctor, before we have to run. Do aliens exist and should Americans be concerned? Not concerned at all. Uh, I think it's arrogant of us to believe that we are the smartest in our cosmic neighborhood and we can learn from a smarter kid in our class. Yeah. Well, Dr. Avi Loeb, uh, professor from Harvard, thank you so much and congratulations on your findings. Very exciting. All right, all week long, we've been talking about the push and pull, the battles in Washington, D.C., over the possibility of an, a secret government program that is studying UFO spacecraft and the remains of non-human uh, specimens or, or organisms. Uh, earlier this week, David Grush came on the show to defend what he's been saying, his testimony under oath in Capitol Hill, that there is a secret program that is reverse engineering these spacecraft. He also told me earlier this week that he has first-hand knowledge, not second-hand knowledge, that such a program exists. And all along, uh, he's gotten some pushback, notably from famed astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. He has simply said, I need to see evidence. He's got a new book out, his 16th book, if you can believe it, 
moments ago. I talked to him about the new book. It's called To Infinity and Beyond, A Journey of Cosmic Discovery. But first, he and I talked about whether or not he believes the latest claims about UFOs, and that could possibly take the cosmic discovery to another dimension. Neil, explain the Fermi paradox to me. It refers to the dichotomy that there's a high probability that extraterrestrial intelligence exists with the fact that we have no evidence of alien life. Where do you land in all that? Yeah, let me just uh, give the backstory on the Fermi paradox. Enrico Fermi, an Italian-American physicist, actually did a calculation. He said to himself, if there are alien civilizations out there, and even if they had modest travel technology, maybe they can reach 10% the speed of light. Not the speed of light, not warp drives, just sort of ordinary, really fast technologies. Then one civilization might uh, colonize a planet, and then they would then colonize two planets after that, and each one of the two after that, you go one to two to four to eight, Within 100 million years or so, given the size of the galaxy, aliens could be in every planet in the galaxy. And that's a much shorter time than the time the galaxy has been around. Mm -hmm. So he concluded that, um, and so he, said, he asked, where are they? And that became known as the Fermi paradox. Yeah. And there's some interesting solutions to that. Maybe interstellar space really is hard, even for brilliant aliens. So that's a that's an easy one to well, talk about. And you're assuming it, the aliens are brilliant. Maybe they're not. <laughs> <laughs> they could be idiots. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Or like Luddites, you know, cavemen. Yeah, I don't want to meet the dumb aliens. Send over the smart <laughs> aliens. Those are the ones. You know, all these people that talk about crashed flying saucers, I'm saying, Send me the ones that can navigate, okay? I don't, I don't want to meet the ones that cross the galaxy and crash on Earth. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Avi Loeb, uh, who's also a physicist, runs the Galileo Project at Harvard. He said, quote, the most efficient path toward new knowledge is through direct evidence. And unfortunately, that was not provided by David Grush, and if it exists, remain a se remains a secret. David Grush this week told me this in response to Dr. Loeb. Take a listen. I, I understand he wants to see proof. Um, unfortunately, I can't do that because I, I need to abide by the law. I'm not here to go to jail. So we have a true transparency issue. And I think the Galileo Project and, and Dr. Loeb, who seems like a nice enough gentleman when I talk to him, needs to lobby the U.S. government for transparency because his astronomy and astrophysics community is being unfortunately degraded and destroyed by not providing this, this information broadly to be studied by highly qualified experts like him and, and other physicists of, of high repute. You're an astrophysicist of the highest repute. I'm guessing you'd be first in line to study the evidence if anybody finally brought it out from behind closed doors. Of course. And, of course, that happened in Mexico. We remember that the alien bodies, they were ridiculed by so many people, but I was actually excited by this. Finally, there's, a, there's an august congressional body where alien uh, mummies are brought forth. That's the kind of thing that should happen in the American Congress and hasn't. I, I, I corresponded with uh, some of the principals with the, that were involved with shepherding the, the, these Mexican aliens. Actually, they're claimed to be from Peru, the Nazca area of Peru. Right. And the Peruvians wonder how did they end up in Mexico. That's a whole, I don't, I don't know either. But the point is, now that you have them on display, it's intriguing. They look awfully humanoid, by the way, to have come from another planet. They mm -hmm. look more human than most life on Earth looks human, and we have DNA in common. That's a separate issue. Scientifically, that this is a start, and now right. we say share the data with yeah. other people, share tissue samples so that other labs can investigate. That's how we roll. Another top-level military officer confirming what most Americans are already starting to believe, aliens do exist. Non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new, and it's been ongoing. Well, a retired U.S. Army colonel going on the record, insisting aliens are real and already communicating with humans. It's the focus of the latest episode of News Nation's new podcast, Reality Check with Ross Coulthard. If you grab your phone, do it. Okay, come on, grab your phone, come to your screen. There's a QR code. It'll take you directly to the podcast or you can also check News Nation's website or our YouTube page. And joining me now is News Nation's special correspondent, Ross Coulthard. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. 
Good morning, Anna. So I have to admit this is not my zone of genius. Um, when we hear non-human intelligence, is that just synonymous with aliens? It is. It's another cute word for alien. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is the person saying this, the very senior former army officer, Colonel Carl Nell, I mean, he's a chap who's advised people at the very top of the U.S. Army. He's advised as a senior advisor to the U.S. Army Combatant Command. Uh, he's also worked in helping reorganise the U.S. Army Reserves, the biggest restructure since the 1970s. And intriguingly, Anna, he's also worked for some of the aerospace companies, Northrop Grumman, uh, Lockheed Martin, Bell Labs. He knows stuff particularly because he's the former director of the UAP task force. He investigated unidentified anomalous phenomena for the Pentagon, and he's saying a non-human intelligence is real, and furthermore, it's been interacting with humanity for a very long time. Yeah, and for the skeptics out there, this is not a guy in some tinfoil hat. This is not some slouch. We can add a retired colonel with the U.S. military to the long list of other credible witnesses publicly saying there is non-human life out there. So at what point will enough be enough and the government just shares what they know? Are they, are they hiding something? And if so, why? Look, I, I, I think the government does know it's hiding stuff. Um, even very senior figures like Christopher Mellon, a former Deputy Undersecretary of Defence, has admitted that the US government, he believes, is hiding things about UAPs. And more importantly, Colonel Nell's comments have been backed by a former admiral in the US Navy, Tim Gallaudet. He's talked about how, quote, I know Colonel Nell is correct with complete certainty. Why has society not taken this world-changing reality seriously, he says? Partly because of a deliberate and systematic disinformation campaign by the US government, which has perpetuated the stigma associated with UAP. So he's had some high-powered support from a former colleague in the services. Right, and you obviously have done a real deep dive into this. So what if we lived in a world where the Pentagon decided they're going to officially admit that there's proof out there of UFOs and UAPs? What would happen next? Look, I don't think the public would be that shocked, to be honest. I think there are a lot of very patronising, haughty people in both private aerospace and parts of the defence and intelligence community who think that you and I and the public can't cope with this news and information. I think we can. And I think it's time that the Pentagon, the president, and indeed the intelligence community were far more candid about what they really know. Look, some of our top-rated content is, is on this very subject. There's obviously a lot of interest out there. And uh, again, you can check out Ross Colthart. You can check our website, our YouTube page, or his brand-new podcast, Reality Check with Ross Colthart. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Go to joinnn.com to find News Nation on your television provider. Also, don't forget to click that red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.